We hope you've enjoyed your luncheon. We're honored to have as our guest today, Lieutenant Brad Snyder, United States Navy, retired. He's gonna offer his perspective of triumph over adversity. Brad believes, and I'll give you this quote, he believes that the pursuit of excellence is not measured by the end result, but the character that is developed in the process. Brad graduated from the Naval Academy with a degree in Naval Architecture. Any Naval Arcs? Okay, there you go, nice. Yeah, not too late to switch. Is just... <laughs> While here, uh, Brad honed his leadership skills as the uh, swim team captain. And upon graduation, he went through a, a long and arduous process to become a qualified explosive ordnance disposal officer. Brad then deployed to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And again, two years later, he deployed this time to Afghanistan with Operation Enduring Freedom. After six months of assault operations, Brad was severely injured by uh, an explosion due to an improvised explosive device, an IED. Brad uh, sustained complete vision loss as a result of the explosion. As a result of his, as part, I guess, as part of his rehabilitation process, Brad uh, returned to his passion for swimming in the pool. And after a few months, he earned a training spot uh, uh, on the U.S. Paralympic, Olympic, Paralympic national team uh, for swimming. So much so that in 2012, uh, at the Paralympics in London, he competed in seven events, earning two gold medals and one silver medal. And his victory in the 400-meter freestyle occurred on September 12th of 2012, marking exactly one day from uh, the day he suffered his vision loss. The U.S. Olympic Committee at that point selected Brad to serve as the United States flag bearer for the closing ceremony of the London 2012 Paralympic Games. A year later, Brad medically retired from the Naval Service in, in 2013, and then in 2016, uh, Brad again returned to the Paralympic Games, and this time in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And at that uh, event, Brad competed in five events and earned three gold medals, one silver medal, and broke a world record that has stood for 30 years prior to him breaking that. And he's currently the world record holder for the 100-meter freestyle event. So uh, <laughs> Brad is not just a world record U.S. Paralympic athlete. And he's not just a combat-decorated uh, United States Navy EOD officer. What you're going to hear is that Brad is a dreamer and Brad is a doer. So please prepare yourself to be inspired, to be motivated, we're very fortunate to have Brad Snyder with us this afternoon, so please join us in giving him a very warm Go Navy welcome. Thank you, sir. Facing this way? Right on. Do you prefer uh, handheld? No, I got one on. Oh, good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I came prepared. Um, so, uh, Great news about that world record. Just want to follow up on that real quick. That uh, event will not be available to be competed in Tokyo. So that means that that's my world record for at least another four years. <laughs> so uh, I normally make the joke after, uh, thank you, Admiral Baker, for that awesome introduction. Uh, that pretty much sums up my story. So we'll go to the Q&A now. <laughs> Just kidding. I'll share a quick anecdote. I, I thought the idea, I, I'd share a little bit about my perspective throughout that year uh, of 2012, and then we'll sort of open it up to some Q&A at the end, if that's all right with you guys. So the September 7, 2011 was a really impactful day in my life. Uh, that morning, we set out on a mission in the Panjwe Valley of Afghanistan looking for, uh, we were actually looking to instigate the end of fighting season. Afghanistan's unique in the world in that most places have four seasons. Afghanistan has two, fighting season and non-fighting season. Um, that's kind of funny, but you can laugh if you want. <laughs> um, so we were trying to instigate the end of fighting season by marching across the Panjwe Valley, which was a small uh, five-kilometer square area where it was like kind of the last major area of Taliban activity in the Kandahar province where we were operating. Uh, we were trying to get them all to go into the Reg Desert to the south and go into Pakistan for the end of the fighting season and so we could rest, rebuild, and kind of bear the winter there. Uh, and uh, we were on a foot patrol in an area that was heavily laden with IEDs. 
Me being the EOD officer in this assault platoon, we had made the decision that tactically the safest way for us to move from one place to another was for me to take a metal detector uh, and wave it in front of our patrol, much like any kind of Vietnam documentary you've seen. I had a metal detector and just waved it in front of me looking for IEDs. Kind of like that, uh, the, the, the fat dude at the beach looking for gold watches in his Speedo. <laughs> that was me in Afghanistan looking for IEDs. Um, at about 7.30 in the morning, I saw the worst thing you could possibly imagine. I was about halfway back in the patrol. I had given the, uh, given the helm to my EOD partner, Adam. I was halfway back in the patrol when I saw a giant blast plume shoot up in the air. And I thought the worst. I thought my buddy Adam had stepped on an IED. He's now at the front of our patrol. Uh, he needs my help. You know, tactically, we tell, we tell none of our assault platoon to move around in an area because where there's one bomb, there's likely many. So we, told them, we tell them all to hold still. So the only person who's going to get to Adam first is going to be me with a PJ, an Air Force medic, right on my back. But we don't want to rush up there because I don't want to step on a secondary, so I'm going to wait for a minute or two. So I waited for a really long time. It felt like forever, uh, listening to my radio, hoping my buddy Adam's voice would come over the radio and tell me he was OK. Nothing came over the radio. So I looked back at my boss, a SEAL lieutenant, and said, hey, I'm going to go up and help, help with the medevac. He said, roger that. He said, if we're going to bring in helicopters, we're going to do it in the field to my left. I said, roger that. I ran up to the front of the patrol and was really confused when I got to the front. It was quite literally a fog of war in a post-blast environment. The, the blast kicks up a bunch of dust and debris in the air. It's, it's literally a thick gray fog, and it's really hard to tell what's going on. So I looked around, and I was instantly elated but very confused to see my buddy Adam across this little ravine to my left, giving me the international WTF sign like this. To which I returned in kind, like, you were up here, what did you see? And he didn't know what had happened. Quickly, I was able to decipher what had happened, though. To my right, there was about a meter and a half wide blast hole in the ground. One uh, downed Afghan in the hole, and another Afghan had been flipped 15 feet forward in the blast. We were working with Afghan Special Forces commandos. Two of them had been injured really badly in this blast. One of them had stepped off of the path that my buddy Adam had cleared and landed on a 40-pound IED. Instantly took the legs off of the guy standing behind the blast, and flip the guy who stepped on it forward about 15 feet. So we have two medics, two EOD techs, and we're going to need to render, uh, render aid to both of these casualties. The problem here was the terrain was very difficult, and our, our casualty was unconscious. Moving an unconscious casualty is incredibly difficult. Any of you guys play with Rescue Randy as midshipmen? You guys know what Rescue Randy is? Is that an EOD thing? Well, Rescue Randy's this dummy that we do in training. He's really heavy. Well, I'll tell you what, Rescue Randy is not nearly as heavy as a casualty in, Ara or in Afghanistan. Uh, with all of his armor, his radios, his weapons on, it was very difficult to move him. It took us almost 10 minutes to get that casualty back 100 feet where we could safely land a helicopter. Uh, I happen to know that you know, we have the, uh, the advantage of surprise so long as the Taliban doesn't know where we are, but we just shot a giant coalition forces highlighter up into the air. Now everyone in the area knows exactly where we are, and we don't have another 10 minutes to sit on target waiting, for, waiting to get counterattacked. We need to move quickly. So I, uh, I grabbed a litter from the back of the, the patrol where we could pick up that second casualty and move him back to the helicopter quicker. I grabbed that litter. I ran back up to the front of the patrol. I jumped across where the first blast hole was, and... I stepped on a secondary that was about a meter away from the first blast site. And everything stood still for a moment. I remember looking down. I could just barely see out of my left eye in the post-blast. and I, I was in the fetal position on the ground. And I looked, and I could see my hands. And then behind my hands, I could see my boots. From the neck down, I didn't see anything wrong. No blood, no damage. And that, in my mind, I knew that I had stepped on an IED, likely a 40-pound IED, a pressure plate. And every other casualty that I had seen to that point in the war was a lot more messed up than I was. And the calculus didn't make sense. And the only rationale I could come up with was that I was dead. I had died. And, uh, I had to work that out, you know, and I, I spent a long time thinking about what that meant. I thought about, you know, all the good things I had done, all the bad things I had done, and I, I thought about, you know, I, at the end, I think I was proud to live the life that I lived. I think I was proud to offer my life in sacrifice. I think I was proud of the good things that I had done, and I think those good things outweighed the bad, and, and now I was just waiting to pass on. I kind of reconciled my death in that moment. 
I was sad that I wouldn't be able to say goodbye to my mom and, and uh, my family, but I was proud of the life that I had lived, and I was ready to pass on. But I didn't. I came back. And I really had this amazing opportunity to come back to life. My buddies on the battlefield cleared to me. They picked me up. They got me on a helicopter. That helicopter took me to a hospital. Uh, a surgeon in Afghanistan spent 12 hours that first day, that first morning, uh, picking all the debris out of my face and putting my face back together. Uh, once I was medically stable, they didn't know the extent of what my, the damage was to my eyes, so they rushed me to Longstreet Air Force Base in Germany. Same crew in the, did the same thing in Longstreet Air Force Base. Another eight hours of surgery there, picking stuff out of my face, trying to fix my eyes. Once I was medically stable at a long stool, they rushed me to Walter Reed, at which point I met my family and began this somewhat lengthy rehab process. Actually, it wasn't that lengthy. It was short, but we'll get to that in a minute. But it was really difficult. I, it was lengthy in my perception because every day that I was in rehab was really, or uh, when I was in intensive care in Walter Reed was really, really scary for me because I was on a heavy amount of pain-killing medication. And that, what, what that, the result of that was my perception of Walter Reed was a lot more like that um, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory movie with Johnny Depp with the Oompa Loompas and everything. Uh, that's what Walter Reed looked like to me because I was hallucinating really badly. And I kept asking my mom, when's the Oompa Loompa doctor coming back? And my mom kept looking at me funny like, there is no Oompa Loompa doctor. <laughs> so it took me a while to kind of wane on those painkillers to figure out what was going on. And I remember this really sobering conversation with surgeons five days after I had gotten to Walter Reed where they said, Brad, there's good news, or Lieutenant Snyder, they called me. Lieutenant Snyder, there's great news. You know, physically, you're going to make 100% of rehab. Like, there's, from your neck down, there's really not a lot of injuries. I had broken my, this bone in my hand, but bones heal and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, unfortunately, there's, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what your vision's going to look like. We're going to have to do this last surgery, and we're going to do all this stuff to your right eye. We're going to do all this stuff to your left eye, and blah, 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 blah. They, they went on about 40 minutes about the things they were going to do to my eyes. And I remember not really understanding any of those things, and I kind of asked at the end, they, they had kept saying this thing that I was unfamiliar with. They kept saying, hopefully we'll get some of your vision back. Hopefully we'll get some of your vision back. Hopefully we'll get some of your vision back. And I, I didn't understand what that meant. Uh, up until that point, I was hallucinating so badly in my mind that I didn't really realize that I wasn't seeing with my eyes. And if I had any passive awareness of the fact that I wasn't seeing with my eyes, I thought maybe there's a bandage, and at some point they're going to take the bandage off and I'm going to be able to see again. It had not occurred to me that I was blind. So I asked the doctor, what do you mean, get some of my vision back? He said, Lieutenant Snyder, you have a less than 1% chance of being able to perceive light and dark with your right eye. We're going to remove your left eye entirely. You'll see nothing on the left side. And I realized that that was doctor speak for you're blind, and you will be blind for the rest of your life. And that's obviously a heavy moment. And unfortunately, I have, I have bad news for all of us. We're all going to face moments like this. Uh, not all of you are going to go blind, hopefully, uh, but there's going to be these moments in your life where we have to face, face these challenges. And, and you, above all, the, those who have chosen to put yourselves in harm's way, you will face these moments. Uh, we will lose friends. We will be in harm's way ourselves. And you will have to rationalize situations like this. But the good news is you're prepared very well. And I remember that moment very well. And I remember that there were two distinct pathways I could, I could go down. One, I could go down the left-hand path and start thinking about all the things that I'll never be able to do. I'll never be able to drive a car. I'll never be able to fly an airplane. Not that I had any vested interest in wanting to fly an airplane, but just trying to be thorough about the things I can and can't do. <laughs> I, uh, I grew up on the Gulf Coast of Florida, some of the most beautiful beaches in the United States. I will never again be able to see those beaches. I get to travel to the Olympic Training Center all the time now, beautiful training center at the base of Pikes Peak some of the most beautiful mountains in our United States, I will never be able to see those mountains ever again. My baby sister is going to grow up one day and meet the man of her dreams. She's going to walk down the aisle in a beautiful white wedding dress, and I will be in the pews, but I will not be able to see my sister get married. And these thoughts all hit me in that particular moment, but I realized that all of those thoughts are fruitless. I cannot change the reality that I'm in. Moreover, I 100% volunteered to be in this spot. Secondly, I, six days prior to this moment, had thought that I had died. But now I'm back to life. So what if I can't see? And another thought occurred to me. In 2009, I lost my best friend in Iraq, Tyler Trahan. He and I went through every spot of EOD school together. Uh, we were you know, attached at the hip for the entirety of our training. Uh, the day after I left Iraq in 2000, 2009, he got there, and a week later, uh, he lost his life in an IED detonation along with three other Marines. 
When Tyler Trahan came back to the United States, he was in a coffin with a flag draped over it. I watched them put that coffin in the ground, and I watched them fold that flag and give it to his mother. How selfish of me would it be to victimize myself over the loss of my vision when my friend Tyler didn't get to come back at all? So I made a commitment to myself and my family in that moment that blindness was not going to be an obstacle for me. I'm going to find a way to make the most of every moment I have left. I'm going to honor my dead friend Tyler by, with the, by the, uh, and thank him for the sacrifice that he made by making the most of my life, moment to moment. Oh, do you guys hear me still? Am I talking loud enough? Oh, gotcha. We're going to edit this out. <laughs> Thank you, Admiral Baker. That was a great introduction. Oh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, so I made a commitment to myself and my family that we were, ob blindness was not going to be an obstacle, and I was going to find a way to make the most of my life moment to moment. And thankfully, when you're in that rehab spot, especially by 2011, we had really figured out the wounded warrior thing. And uh, there was actually a number of people who were actually excited that I was blind. And they had a little clipboard out, and they were saying, what sports are you interested in? And we're like, have you ever thrown a discus? Have you ever thrown a javelin? I was like, what are you guys talking about? They have this thing called Warrior Games, and they have a Navy team, and they were stoked that an athlete got uh, hurt, and they were like, we really, need, <laughs> we really need a blind shot putter. Do you think you could throw shot put? <laughs> no joke, I flew out to Ventura, California to, to be a part of a Navy Wounded Warrior camp and learned how to throw a shot put, to which point they realized I'm really terrible at that and thought <laughs> maybe swimming was a better option. Uh, so fast forward, I had the opportunity to get in the pool. I actually moved here to Baltimore to uh, simultaneously work in a post-military -tra uh, post transition internship at a software company in Baltimore and also trained for the, the uh, upcoming Paralympics. Uh, at some point in that, that pipeline, someone at the Association of Blind Athletes asked me, do you realize how lucky you are to be hurt in a uh, Paralympic year because you have the opportunity to go to London? And I thought, no, that's an interesting way of reframing the perspective. I like your style. Um, <laughs> So uh, to fast forward the story in short order, the, the first shot out of the gates, I, got, I went to go to the Olympic Training Center, swam in a meet. Uh, my first 50 meter freestyle, I dove off the blocks. I hit the lane line on the right hand side, I hit the lane line on the left hand side, I hit the right, the right hand side again. And we call this ping ponging because I don't really know where I'm going. I hit the left hand side, I hit the right hand side. I came in and touched the wall. I was literally bleeding on both sides. And I was huffing and puffing and I got out and everyone was like, oh my god, that was awesome. <laughs> and as I'm kind of tending to my wounds, I was like, what do you mean that was awesome? That was horrible. They were like, you're the fifth fastest blind swimmer in the world right now. <laughs> and I thought, no, 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 you guys are looking at the wrong list. Turns out they were right. And after a couple months more of training, I went to the Paralympic trials, and I was able to raise that number five to a number one world ranking in two different events. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to go to the Paralympics. And it, it, throughout, that, throughout that lead up to the Paralympics, as you might imagine, uh, this, this narrative started to emerge where, you know, Navy sailor gets blown up and within a year has the opportunity to go to the Paralympics and represent his country uh, as part of Team USA, right? And, and it's going to the Paralympics, so there's a lot, a lot of media attention and buzz. Well, this is 2012 in the Paralympics, and we had, a, we had a writer in Philly who wrote an article, and we were really excited about that. And... Uh, I remember this sports writer asking me, so Lieutenant Snyder, are you nervous to compete in the Paralympics for the first time? And unfortunately, I said the first arrogant thing that popped in my mind. I said, no. <laughs> I said, uh, sir, I used to defuse bombs in Afghanistan for a living. How hard could Paralympics be? And he laughed, and that went into the article. And I remember reading that afterward and thought, oof. <laughs> that was kind of a dick thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> Not exactly the pillar of humility with that comment, right? I really regretted uh, that remark afterward, though. I, I do remember walking through the village, this Paralympic village, with all these different athletes from all these different countries speaking in different languages about their different events, from wheelchair basketball to goalball, a sport specifically for blind people, to track and field and swimming. Then I walked out into a swimming arena surrounded by 10,000 people. Uh, up to this point in my career, or it's actually 18,000. I said the wrong number. 18,000 people. Up to that point in my career and swimming career, how many people do you think we can fit into Lejeune? Bill here? How many people can we fit in the Lejeune? A thousand. A thousand. Biggest meet of my career, Army, Navy, which we won all four years I was here, by the way. Um, <laughs> a thousand people times 18, by far the biggest crowd I'd ever been in front of. And it is definitely an emotional roller coaster to walk out in front in a Speedo of 18,000 people. <laughs> 
But in any case, I, uh, the, to getting ready for an, event, an international event like that, you have to like, do this weird thing where you, you show up and uh, you do almost like a plebe style inspection before you go out onto the pool deck. You have to make sure that your Speedo's the right thing and your cap only has the right flag on it and it's three inches by five inches and has the right font and you can have a, your goggles can only say Speedo one time and so on and so forth. So once you pass this inspection, you go out onto the pool deck. Or you, go and you sit in these sets of chairs. There's eight sets of eight chairs. And this represents like all the evenings program, heat by heat. And they walk you out heat by heat. So at first you start off in this little tiny area. It's really quiet. All you can hear is the iPod of the guy next to you, which I thought was really funny because he's from China and he doesn't speak any English and he's listening to Hotel California. <laughs> and then uh, trying to figure that out when the referee comes over and escorts us to the next set of chairs and the next set of chairs and the next set of chairs and all of a sudden I'm walking out onto that pool deck to this dubstep music which was invented while I was in the Walter Reed Hospital and I'd never really heard it before. And this voice of God is saying all these different things up at the top and I can't really hear what's going on but I'm really getting jacked and getting excited. And my... Uh, we walked out into our lanes, and my coach walked me up to the lane. I took off my gear, and then I put my hand on the block, and I visualized my race, and I settled my nerves, and I realized, or I told myself, I was the most prepared swimmer in that field. I was the most experienced. I was the most trained. I've been to Warren back twice. I've swam back and forth a pool like that so many times in my life, I can't count it. All I had to do was execute, put those nerves at bay, and just decided to dive in and, and own my race. Now the 400 meter freestyle is eight lengths of the pool. And uh, I, my, my game strategy was just get through those eight lengths without, without crashing. So I had kind of changed my stroke so that I didn't crash. I was looking for the lane line on both sides. Uh, got through my first lap, okay. Got through my second lap, okay. Got through, in the third lap, started to get a little bit tired, but I started to build in my legs so that I don't get, to, don't get uh, too off course. In the third hundred, I started to hear the crowd get really loud. I don't really know what they're cheering for, but I hope that it's me. I get through that last fourth, I get through my fourth hundred, I come into the wall. Now this funny thing happens in Paralympic sport that doesn't happen in any other sport, specifically blind sports. When, uh, did anyone watch the 2016 games? The Olympic Games. What was the big storyline out of the 2016 Games? Michael Phelps, right? Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps wins his 433rd gold medal and another world record, right? What does Michael Phelps do when he wins a gold medal? He looks at a jumbotron, right? Giant jumbotrons as Michael Phelps wins again, right? And what does Michael Phelps do? He looks up at that jumbotron and he splashes the water, right? He gives it a fist, like fist, like, right? I'm really, I'm really excited. I give it another one for victory, right? <laughs> he splashes the water again. He looks over at that trash talking South Africa guy. He's like, what now, South Africa? <laughs> well, none of that happens in blind sports because we can't see the jumbotron. <laughs> So I finished what I feel like was the race of my life. I think I ra executed my race plan. I've got this tingly in my hand. I really want to just fist pump. Uh, but what kind of idiot am I going to look like if the guy in lane eight had the race of his life, actually, and I got second, right? So I, I don't want to look like an idiot, so I just sat there. <laughs> I hear that voice of God, the announcer guy, and he's announcing, and it sounds like this to you in the pool because you got your ears full of water. It's like, <laughs> So then I, I feel the guy next to me finish, so at least I beat him, right? <laughs> and uh, my inclination is to lean over and ask him, hey man, what happened? But he doesn't know either, he's blind too, and <laughs> he's from the Ukraine anyway, so he doesn't speak any English, and so we all just sit here. 18,000 people, they can see the Jumbotron, they're all super excited, and they are cheering, and you really want to believe they're cheering for you, but again, you don't want to look like an idiot. Then this magic thing happens where they blow the referee, uh, the referee blows the whistle, and that means the heat is over, and at that point, my coach could lean over and talk to me. He said two words I'll never forget. He said, you won. That story came true. I got blown up on the 7th of September, 2011, and I won a gold medal on September 7, 2012. And it was a pretty awesome moment. Now, the real awesome moment comes shortly after that, right? We get out of the pool, and all of a sudden now I know the crowd is cheering for me, so I can like, really take that in. You wave, and they cheer, and you wave, and they cheer, and you go over and talk to media from all these different countries, from Sweden, Brazil, Japan, and they all want to know what it feels like to be a gold medalist, which you don't really know at that moment because you're, just, you're brand new to it, and you're really like huffing and puffing. So you do this talk. In your mind, you sound like super smooth, like, I'm Brad Snyder, I just want a gold medal. But what you actually sound like is, ah, I just want to thank my mom. And, ah, and you look at it on YouTube afterward, and you're like, oh, that's a really embarrassing video. I wish that would go away. 
And then you go take a pee test to make sure you're not doping, and then you walk to the podium. And the podium's that magical moment that we all visualize, that we all see on TV, that we all really kind of revere. And it's a cool moment, right? For a moment, this delegate from London comes over and gives you a bouquet of flowers, and they put a medal around your neck, and they play this fancy music, and it's a, it's a neat moment. It's kind of a, attaboy, Brad, you did something cool. But it's a pretty fleeting sentiment. Why? What happens next? They, well, you know, there's something in between the step down. They play our anthem. They play, they play our anthem and they raise our flag higher than all the other flags in that arena. And as I stood at attention listening to the anthem play, I started thinking back across all the people who had helped me get there. To my buddy Adam and the medic Kyle, who cleared to me on the battlefield when I was down, literally using their metal detector to clear in a minefield to get to me to prop me up to get me onto a helicopter where a pilot put himself, his flight crew, and his aircraft at risk to land in a combat area to take me to a hospital, where a surgeon, she and her staff, spent 12 hours picking the debris out of my face and putting it back together. To the same crew who did the same thing in Longstreet Air Force Base, Germany, to the same crew who did the same thing in Walter Reed Medical Center down the road here in Maryland. To my mom who got that call at 5.30 in the morning saying her son had been blown up, she needs to fly to Maryland as soon as possible to participate in my rehab, to my brothers and my sister who wrapped their arms around my mom and got her through those trying moments, to those crazy folks who wanted to get me into the Warrior Games and to, to contextualize how lucky I was to be injured in a Paralympic year, to Tyler Trahan, who offered his life and sacrifice so that I might have another moment to make the most of myself. As I stood at attention listening to that anthem play, I realized that individuals never accomplish anything truly great. It's when communities leverage their collaborative efforts towards a cohesive goal, that's where magic happens, and that's where gold medals are possible. Now, this is our honor and courage and commitment luncheon, right? And I'm going to just spend one moment talking about those core virtues that unite our Navy community. For me, honor is critically important, and that's my buddy Tyler. We are all part of a much bigger community than we are by ourselves. And we come here looking for that. We come here wanting to be a part of the brigade and midshipmen. We come here wanting to be a part of the United States Navy to serve our country, the United States of America. I, uh, I urge you guys to take strength in that community. But to be a part of that community, you have to do certain things. You have to embrace certain virtues. You have to embrace certain values. And that is what it means to me to have honor. Honor those like Tyler Trahan who are a part of that legacy who gave their lives up so that we might have an opportunity to continue to live up to the legacy of those who have gone before us. Courage. It's scary to do a lot of the things that we do. Taking apart bombs is scary. Jumping out of aircraft is scary. Flying aircraft is scary. It takes courage to do the right thing. It takes courage to do the right thing over and over and over again. But that is the, the path that you have chosen for yourselves. Take strength from each other and when, when you have the opportunity to do the right thing, even though it's difficult, you absolutely must have courage to do the right thing. And commitment. Any path of development requires day in, day out, preparation, training, and commitment to doing the right thing at all times. That is the only way to work your way through rehab. It's the only way to work your th way through training. And it's the only way to attain the levels of success that we all aspire for. Commitment. It's a day in, day out thing. All right, that's all I have. I want to leave it there and I want to open it to question and answer for the next however much time we have. I might have gone a little bit long. Thanks, guys. So we've got, uh, we've got some time here for questions and answers, and I will uh, mo be the moderator for that. So let's, uh, let's, get, let's see where we want to go. This is amazing. Thank you, Brad. Uh, I'm just so... It's my pleasure. Grateful. Okay, let's, let's see what we got. Oh, six. <laughs> that was an easy one. <laughs> Why do you wear glasses? Great question. So... I, uh, Does everybody hear that? Can everybody hear the question? I, I can walk around and uh, have you ask the question, too. We're... Question is... Why do I wear glasses? Yep. Yeah, so I have two prosthetic eyes. They removed my left eye entirely, and they removed half of my right eye. Um, 
I took most of the blast on the right side of my face and my, eye, my right eye was pretty badly damaged, but they were able to keep the muscle in the back. Uh, the left eye had a piece of debris that went inside, uh, causing an infection, and so they had to remove the whole eye. Uh, what you see are two prosthetic eyes. Um, they're a cool story. They're painted to look like my sister's eyes. So we, sometimes when we're walking around, people are like, wow, you really have the same color eyes. And we're like, we have the same eyes. Uh, <laughs> but they're prosthetic lenses that are prosthetic devices that cost five grand a piece. Thankfully, the VA was willing to pay the bill for those, um, but I'm not. So uh, if I do something like bend down to tie my shoe and I hit my head, uh, I could really badly damage both the tissue around my eye and the prosthetic itself. So these are a last line of defense. I have glass so that I can protect my face. Um, the idea at the beginning was I guess I could wear sunglasses, but then I thought everyone would think I'm trying to be Ray Charles, so I'm, I'm definitely not, and I thought regular glasses would be the better alternative. Thanks, Brad. Yes, sir. Brad, this is Admiral Buck. Uh, did eight months with you. Are you in training at this time for any type of sports competition? Yes, sir. Great question. I'm happy to report that I am currently ranked number five in the world for the Paralympic ranking for selection criteria for the Tokyo Paralympic Games in the sport of triathlon. I uh, just wrapped up five different races across different locations across, this, uh, across the globe. I raced in Yokohama, Japan. Uh, Luzon, Switzerland, Banyoles, Spain, Montreal, Canada, and Sarasota, Florida. And across those races was able to earn that number five ranking. If I can hold that number five ranking or better between now and June of next year, I should be selected again for my third Paralympics to represent Team USA in Tokyo. Awesome. Are you going to also do swimming and do dual sports? I'm going to try. Yeah, so I have a, a meet coming up in December. I haven't swam in a meet since Rio, actually. Uh, so I have a, a meet in December to see if I still have what it takes to swim. The 50-meter freestyle, the 100-meter back, both events that I have, or well, I won the 50 in Rio, I got silver in the 100 back, and then the 100 fly. Uh, the 100 fly turns into a fun story. After the Rio games, one of my competitors from J Japan, a guy named Keiichi Kimura, who speaks no, or spoke no English at the time, reached out to me via Facebook and said, I want to train like you. He uh, observed my performance in Rio, and uh, he, the games are coming back to Tokyo, so he really wanted to train like the best. He emailed me and said, hey, I want to train like you. We brought him to Baltimore, introduced him to my swim coach and my, my strength and conditioning coach, a guy who used to work at Under Armour. He works at his own gym now. And uh, I'm happy to report Keiichi has been living here in Baltimore for the last year and a half. He's now fluent in English. He did an interview with a, with a Japanese new age, news agency the other day in completely English. Blew my mind. Uh, and he's now the world ranked number one in a number of events to include the 100 meter fly. Um, I don't think I have a snowball's chance in hell of competing against him in that particular event. I do think there's a strong possibility I could be top eight. And I, having been able to participate in his development of this dream of wanting to be a Tokyo or a Japanese gold medalist in front of a home crowd training in my home hometown, Baltimore, uh, I'm really excited about wanting to be in that heat. So I'm going to try to qualify for the 100-meter fly to compete against my buddy Keiichi, hopefully alongside of him when he wins gold for his country on home turf. That's great. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Brad, Frank Thor, class of 81. Um, can you expound a little bit more on your decision uh, when you went through, is it about me or is it about something else? Uh, that powerful decision when you're lying there and you have all the rights in the world to feel sorry for yourself. Can you talk a little bit more about what went into that thought process and how you look back at it today? Yeah, I don't view it as, I, didn't, I felt like pretty quickly I didn't, I didn't have the right. I, knowing Tyler the way I had, or the way I did, and feeling that sacrifice the way that I did, I didn't feel like it was an option for me to feel sorry for myself or, or to victimize myself. That happened pretty quickly. Uh, and I, I think... Looking back on the whole thing, I think one of the things I wanted to finish this talk with is just affirming the idea that this place works. Uh, when I faced that situation, it was almost second nature to you know, utilize those stoic tenets of control what you can control and let go of what you can't. I can't, I can't take back the blindness. Uh, I can't change the fact that I'm in that hospital room and that the eyes don't work. So why vest a whole bunch of emotion to the idea that I, I want to have that vision back. I, I don't have it. Uh, and moreover, there's a, a pathway in front of me and a set of resources that I can acquire that's going to allow me to uh, maintain or seek a quality of life that 
that someone else doesn't have. Tyler doesn't have the ability to do little things that I get to do. You know, have a delicious cup of coffee or go give a lunch talk about how rich life is or uh, have a little piece of Royce chocolate or all these little treats that we have in our life that make our lives really nice are things that Tyler gave up. He gave up all of those. Just, I, I can't say it in any stronger language. How selfish of me would it be to, to, to throw away all that perspective when my buddy Tyler doesn't get that at all? Uh, and I think that all happened really fast in that moment. I think the decision to swim was a much slower decision. I was probably the last one on board with this whole Paralympic vision. I trained in, uh, when I was in high school, I trained with who I would argue is the best male American swimmer to never make the Olympic team. My buddy Robert tried for the Olympics in 2000, he tried for the Olympics in 2004, he tried for the Olympics in 2008, and he tried for the Olympics in 2012. All said and done, he got third six times. And uh, third is the cutoff to make the Olympic team. Uh, and he's a victim of, to some extent, the Michael Phelps era. With Michael Phelps swimming so many events, he absorbed that billet for a number of athletes, to include my buddy Robert, who was the world ranked number four, who did not get to compete in the Olympics in either 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012. I say all that to say, I know what it takes to be an Olympic caliber athlete. Uh, and I, I, that when someone came up to me and said, you have the opportunity to go to the Paralympics, having the background of training with Robert, I was like, I'm not Robert. I'm not that good. There's no way that I have the opportunity to be at that level. Uh, it was shocking to me that I was. Uh, and that's a reason that I wanted to go back to Rio is to prove, prove that it wasn't a fluke. London felt like a fluke to me. It felt like an accident. It felt like I didn't deserve to be there. And still, to some extent, I feel like I, I probably don't deserve to be this level of athlete. Uh, so I feel it's part of what my drive comes from. I, I feel like I'm compelled to keep proving to people that I'm supposed to be here. I still don't feel like I am, though, which is, is bizarre, I guess. But again, for me, I think the perspective of putting, being grateful for the life that I have, that happened very quickly. This notion of going on to do Paralympics and everything has been a, a, slow, a slower decision that I don't even really know how I feel about it to this day, let alone back then, if that makes any sense. We have about five minutes, and um, I'm reserving the next question for one of our midshipmen. Great. Here you go. Uh, sir, midshipman said class wall. I just want to begin by thanking you for speaking today. It's truly been an honor uh, to listen to your story. Uh, my question is, uh, we've heard a lot about your training, and you just mentioned how your reaction to your experience, it was second nature. I was wondering if you could speak to how to train your character and how you made that, your character, second nature. I'm so glad you asked, and it's kind of, it's akin to a module that I'm trying to codify over in LEL, this notion of how do we train resilience, how do we train moral character. Uh, I have a theory, or I believe that the, the framework, the, the way that we train in the physical domain can be applied to both the mental domain and the moral domain. The way that you get better, how do you get better at push-ups? You do push-ups. Yeah, how do you get better at pull-ups? You do pull-ups. How do you get better at electrical engineering? You do electrical engineering, right? Yeah, exactly. So you see the point I'm going for, to train our ability to navigate adversity, that uh, I'm in that loop, right? That go back to the, I'm in the hospital bed and the doctor just told me I'm blind. That's an adverse situation, a situation I did not anticipate and that's a, got a heavy amount of circumstance and uh, you know, whatever you want to, gravitas or whatever you want to put on that moment. Navigating that takes some mental effort and to get better at navigating those situations, we have to navigate those situations, which is what this institution is intended to do. This institution is intended to artificially create stress for the brigade of midshipmen so that you can practice navigating those stresses. Same thing goes in the moral domain. All these things like signing taps. It's like this kind of constant conversation about when we talk about integrity in, in, in LEL, we go back to that, is it, is it the right thing or the wrong thing to sign taps for your buddy, right? And it, it's a constant, really big problem for a midshipman to rationale. Well, it, it doesn't feel like a big deal, and you know he's he's going to this concert in D.C. and I really he just well, he wants to have a good time. Is it that big of a deal if I just go ahead and sign the taps thing? What's the right answer? Is it that big of a deal? 
It is because it's part of the habit. It's an opportunity for you to do the right thing. It's an opportunity for you to do that rep. Do one little easy rep. Don't sign taps. You just did a rep. It's now a little bit easier for you to do the right thing the next time. So is it a big deal in the, in the, the grand circumstance of everything? No. But it's an opportunity that you just threw away, potentially, to do the right thing. And I, I like this notion of reps in the moral domain and the mental domain because it contextualizes for us how do we get better at those sorts of things. And I don't know if it's because I'm stubborn or dumb, but I had always done the right thing, I think, up until that point, minus a couple instances which were outlined in that book, if you care to read it. Uh, I feel like I had habitualized doing the right thing or I had habitualized the idea of navigating adversity. So when I fell into that situation, even though I had never navigated the notion of being blind for the rest of my life, I had navigated adversity. I had put myself in hard situations and I had navigated those hard situations. Uh, so blindness was to some extent foreign, but not all the way. It's just a hard situation that I have to navigate, and I use this framework. I use that stoic framework, control what I can control, let go of what I can't, to start me on the process of putting that into perspective and moving forward. Does that make sense? Do you guys buy that whole moral reps thing? Yes. You like it? Yes. Cool. Brad, thank you. Thanks for sharing your passion for leadership, your commitment to us your commitment to the institution and the mission of the Naval Academy, your, commission to our, your, your commitment to our nation. Um, as you know, uh, mariners find their way at sea using a compass, and uh, we all need that compass, the moral compass that you are talking about right now. And uh, we want to give you this, this token uh, symbol. It's a, it's a brass compass. It, it says on it, uh, Vice Admiral Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. Uh, United States Naval Academy, and we would like that to be yours, and grateful Thank appreciation you. for your time here. Thank you very much. Us share. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it.